right, gang, let's move into the next major topic coming out of chapter 12, which are residuals. And residuals are our fancy term for errors. Sometimes when we're predicting, we make errors. All right, we're not perfect. It's hard, in fact, it's impossible in the real world to be perfect. Um, we make errors and we, we keep track of those errors. We call those residuals. So each residual is the difference between your observed Y value and the corresponding predicted Y value. All right, so when I say observed Y value, you get these values from your actual data, all right? Get Y values, so get observed Y values from data. And you get your predicted Y values from your LSRL because that's what the least squares regression line is. It's a predicting line. So we get predicted Y values from the LSRL. So we're going to check out what we predicted against what we actually saw. And we hope that difference is zero. We hope we don't make a, an error, right? We hope what we predict is what we actually see. But I'm telling you, the real world's messy. So we're going to have some residuals. We're going to have some errors. So a residual is always an actual Y value minus a predicted Y value. And I have the A and the P underlined. Just I used to be an AP stats teacher, and it was helpful for me to remember that it was actual minus predicted, A minus P. All right? Once we get all these residuals, so we're gonna calculate all sorts of little errors for all of our data values, then we're gonna make a whole new plot called a residual plot. And instead of going L1 against L2, like we did for our scatter plot, we're gonna go L1 against our residuals. And I'll show you how to make that. But we're gonna be looking for something different in our residual plot. So when you make a residual plot, you want to see a scattered pattern. You actually want to see a mess in your residual plot. That tells you that you have a good fitting model. All right, so unlike the scatter plot, in the original plot, you wanna see the line, and in the residual plot, you wanna see a hot mess. That actually means you have a good fitting model. We run into problems when our residual plot has a pattern. A residual plot with a pattern suggests there exists a better regression model. And it actually, it's super strong. It tells us how to find this better regression model. So we're gonna take a look at some data. All right, the first part of this question is basically all review of everything we did in the first half of this chapter. So let's take a look at this. It says, consider the data on height in inches and weight in pounds for American females between ages 30 and 39. Okay, so if I take a look, I hear two numerical variables. I hear height and weight, and I got units on both of them. So let me go ahead and just make sure I take note that I have my two numerical variables. Anytime I have two numerical variables, I know I'm gonna be looking at a chapter 12 problem. I'm gonna scooch this up because for this, this first part of the problem, it's not referring to residuals, all right? This first part of the problem is all review from the first half of the chapter. So I'm gonna scooch this up and I'll, I'll come back to this once we get to the residual part of this question. So if I push that back up to the top, all right, we can see it's saying our, our standard set of directions, find the LSRL, the correlation coefficient, Interpret that R, the slope, the y-intercept. Use the LSRL to predict a woman's weight if she's 63 inches and predict the weight at 70 inches. So we have got a lot to do. You're gonna wanna give yourself kind of write small. I mean, I gave us as much space as I could afford, but it's gonna take a lot to write all of this in here. So the first thing I'm gonna do, put my data in. So let's go see what we're getting data-wise when we look through this, or not data-wise, but scatter plot wise excuse me, as I look through this. Okay, so I'm gonna turn my calculator on, clear out some lists, go into my Y equals, clear out my old LSRL, that was from the athletes in the return to sport time. So I'll get that out, and uh, let me put some data in. So give me a moment to do some data entry. Okay, 
So I get that in and I'm always gonna do my check. I have the same number of data values in L1 as L2, so that's good. Let me see what this plot looks like when I hit zoom nine. Uh, that looks pretty linear to me, right? Uh, I think I can put a line over that and that's what the directions are saying to do. So, okay, let me find the LSRL. I'll find the correlation coefficient and I'll interpret R, the slope and the y-intercept. Because again, when it comes to this chapter, there are four statistics you'll need to interpret for me. R, the slope, the y-intercept, and then when we get there, R squared. So we've done three of the four at this point. All right, so we should be able to interpret R, the slope, and the y-intercept. R squared's coming later. All right, so let's do this. It's always my same set of commands. Stat, calc, eight, L1, L2, Y1. Now for the sake of just saving room, I'm not gonna write all three lines and then transfer this over. I'm just gonna go ahead and go for it. So instead of A, I'm gonna write negative 98.23. Instead of B, I'm gonna write 3.6. I'll go to two decimal accuracy this time. Actually, I'll go three again, just to stay consistent. So negative 98.235 and then 3.596. Right, and instead of Y and X, if I look at my y's, that's weight. And if I look at my x's, that's height. And I'm also gonna put the hat over the weight. So as I do all of that for my LSRL, I believe I can predict your weight with the equation negative 98.234, excuse me, 235 plus 3.596 times your height. There is the equation of my LSRL. If I hit graph, it should go through pretty well. Yeah, okay. The next thing it asked me to do was interpret R. So my R is 0.995. Let me push my calculator off to the side. So for R, which is 0.995, again, when you wanna interpret R, you owe me three adjectives and you owe me some context. You need to tell me whether R is positive or negative. You need to use the word linear. And then you need to determine if it was strong, moderate, or weak. So if I look at this, this is positive. I'm definitely gonna use the word linear. And this is strong, it's very close to one. So I would say there is a strong, positive, linear relationship between the height and weight for American females in their 30s. All right, the next thing it asks me to do is interpret the slope. So here's the slope. It is 3.596. Right. I like to make it a unit ratio. And then I like to think about the units. It's always rise over run or the y variables over the x variables. So if you think about this just in terms of units, the y units were pounds and the x units were inches. So this is basically saying for every inch taller a woman gets, she gains about 3.596 pounds. Okay, let me use that template that we talked about back in example 10 and fill this in for our problem this time out. So as I look through this, for every one, now our units here, so for every one inch increase in height, the predicted average increase in weight is 3.596 pounds. So I'm gonna take that template and I'm just gonna interpret it for our particular problem. All right, so here we go. For every one inch increase in height, 
the predicted average increase in a woman's weight is 3.596 pounds. I've got both of my units in there. I've got the word predicted. I've got average because it's an average rate of change. That's looking pretty good. Okay, so let's see how we're going. I've got, I did find the LSRL. I interpreted, or I found the correlation coefficient. I interpreted it. I'm up to interpreting the y-intercept. All right, so my y-intercept, let me put a little division down this. So my y-intercept is 0, negative 98.235. So let's think about the units on this. If this is x units, this is inches. And if this is y units, this is pounds. And again, this is another example of extrapolation, right? This is massive extrapolation, actually, um, because I had data uh, on heights from 58 to 72 inches. Zero inches is well outside of that data range. No problem, it's probably model breakdown. Actually, I know it's model breakdown because look at that weight number. But let me go back to the template and let's try and use this, okay? So when your height is zero inches, the predicted weight is negative 98.235 pounds. So let me write that up. So we have here, when a woman when a woman's height is zero inches, her predicted weight is negative 98.235 pounds. Okay. And again, commonalities. I, I want us to take note that inches are in both of these write-ups. Pounds are in both of these write-ups, right? I have the units for both numerical variables. I have predicted in both of these because this is off of the predicting line, all right? This is all stuff I'm predicting. The only actual data values I have are up here. All right, now this has the word average in it because slopes are average rates of change. Okay, so I've got that. Now it says, use the LSRL to predict a woman's weight if she's 63 inches. So I wanna use this equation and they're telling me 63 inches. So if I hear 63 inches, that's a height value. So I'm gonna plug in 63 and see what the predicted weight is. So let me partition this off. And so I will have my first weight I will predict when the height, we'll go with height being 63. You don't need to have this notation. This is math notation. This is saying I'm gonna predict weight when the height is 63. But basically what we're gonna do is negative 98.235 plus 3.596. And the number I'm plugging in for height is 63. Let's see what we get back out here. I'm getting about 128.313. And that would be, if I'm thinking about it, that would be LBs, right? This is her weight, so that's in pounds. All right, so I've got that happening. The next thing I wanna do is I wanna predict this woman's weight. Um, when her height is 70 inches. So let's see what we got with that. So I'm gonna do negative 98.235 plus 3.596, and this time I'm gonna plug in 70. So we're gonna go negative 98.235 plus 3.596 times 70, 
and now I'm looking at 153.485. So that's what I got coming off of my, my predicting line, right? I got my predicting line and then I used it to predict a woman's height. Um, so great. With that, let's take it a step further now and let's talk about finding these residuals, okay? So I think you can see that when we talk about the woman who is 63 inches tall, do you see that I have a little bit of an error, right? Do you see, she was actually 128 pounds and I thought she was 128.313 pounds. So I overestimated her weight by a little, just a small error, but an error, and we wanna keep track of that. All right, how about the 70 inch tall woman? Her weight, I thought she'd be 154, about not 154, excuse me, 153.485 pounds, and what was her height really, or excuse me, her weight really was 153. So I have a little bit of an error there. And that's what a residual is. So when I say calculate the residual, for a height that is 63 inches. When we're talking about calculating residuals, if I want the residual for the lady that was 63 inches tall, I want the actual height, excuse me, actual weight, minus the predicted weight. All right. And so when I want the actual weight minus the predicted weight, we're gonna get these from, from two different spots. You always get your observed data values from your raw data, and you always get your predicted values from your LSRL. So let's look at the 63 inch tall woman. All right, so again, the 63 inch tall woman was actually 128 pounds, but I predicted her weight to be 0.313 pounds. So let's go play this out. So her actual weight was 128, I thought it was 128.313. That would be a difference of negative 0.313 LBs. Okay. For the 70 inch tall woman, let's see what her residual is. So we're gonna go actual weight minus predicted weight. Same deal, I get my actual weight from my raw data and I get my predicted weight from my LSRL because that's what the LSRL is. It's just the predicting line. All right, so let's see what was going on for the 70 inch tall woman. Let me get my data back in view and see what we got. So for her, she was actually 153 pounds. I thought she was 153.485 pounds. Let's subtract those two numbers to get the residual. So we are looking at what, negative 0.485 LBs. Okay, so here I was off by about a third of a pound here, almost half a pound. Okay, so with that, we're gonna pause for a moment. I'm gonna show you on my calculator. We're gonna go back to my computer and I'm gonna show you on your calculator how you can do all of this and how you can make this residual plot. Because basically what's about to happen, if I scoot back to all of this, all right, a residual plot it's a new scatter plot. Instead of L1 against L2, we're gonna do L1, so we're gonna keep the X variables, but instead of going against the Y variables, I'm gonna put residuals here. So for example, instead of 70 comma 153, I'm gonna do 70 comma negative 0.485. And instead of 63, 128, I'm gonna do 63 comma negative 0.313. So for each of these y values, I'm gonna go find the error, right? See how far off I was, and I'm gonna generate a whole new list. We're gonna make a residual plot when we do L1 against the residuals, okay? And then what we're gonna hope for is that that residual plot is a mess. So again, like I said, I'm gonna pause for a moment, we're gonna to go to the calculator, and then I'll, I'll meet back up with you and we'll talk about our write-up. Hey Math43, so I wanna show you how to make a residual plot with your calculator. Before we do that, we're going to need to actually create the LSRL. Um, and yeah, we, you have to create the LSRL before you get to your residual plot. So let's do that. Like always, I'm gonna put my X values in L1, my Y values in L2, and I'm gonna do stat calc eight. Um, 
So let's just check. My data is in there. Uh, it's always a good idea to just check uh, that you have the same number of observations in L1 as L2. If they're different, you will get an error popping up. It'll say dimension mismatch. So just be on the lookout for that. Uh, if I look at my stat plot, that is ready to go. So I, I like to always graph mine before I get going. Um, and as I look at that, it looks pretty good. Um, I just, I noticed that I had a little action here. I don't know if you saw there was like these dot, dot, dots, like my calculator was thinking. I have a feeling what that means is I did not clear out my Y equals from the last problem I did. And when I go back into my Y equals, there it is. The last problem I did on my calculator was that one about um, called a shock time and survival rate. So I, I could tell something was up. My calculator is working harder than it needed to. So I'm just going to clear out my previous problem. Um, even if I didn't, my calculator would overwrite the new LSRL for this problem. But I just like to clear stuff out as I start um, new problems. And, and I forgot to clear out my Y1. Okay, so let me go back to this scatter plot. Uh, it's looking pretty linear, okay? So I think I'm going to get a pretty strong R. That's great. Here we go. So let me head off of this and let's hit stat, go to calc, option eight. And now that we've done the three pieces that we give this, this calc function, just always put them in, L1, L2, Y1, always. So here we go, L1, comma, L2, comma, and then it's the fun ride to get to Y1. So we go to vars, then we hit the right arrow to go to Y variables. Then we're always gonna be in function mode and then pick one, all right? Y1, Y2, Y7, go nuts. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and just hit Y1. And then when I do that, there comes my, my Y intercept, my slope, my R squared and my R value. Okay, great. So we can use those numbers to answer almost all of this first problem, but I, I wanna remind us how we can also use our calculator to predict a weight, to predict a y value when x is 63, and it's also asking us to predict a y value when x is 70. So let's do that. If I go back to my graph, all right, now I should see that LSRL going through, and it's also been dropped into y1. Great. Okay, so whenever you want to use your calculator to predict a y value, we're going to hit second, trace, we're going to go option one, Okay, and then I needed to push or uh, put in 63. That was the first weight I wanted to predict a height. Oops, sorry, I wanted to predict a weight for this height. So if a woman is 63 inches tall, what do I predict her weight to be? 128.34. Right? And that, that decimal is more accurate than the one we just did by hand because I was rounding to two or three decimal places before, and there's no rounding here. And if I want to do it for 70, I'll just repeat the same calculator commands. So let's plug it in for 70. And it looks like we have 153.515. All right, and we just went through calculating those residuals by hand, right? We would take the actual Y values and subtract out the predicted Y values. So let me just call back up 63 for a moment, okay? So this was my predicted weight for 63 inches, and we want to compare that to the actual weight from our data point of 128. So I would go actual Y value of 128 minus predicted Y value of 128.34, and we had a residual of about negative 0.34 pounds, right? And I could do the same thing for 70, right? We had what, a predicted weight? It looks like a 153, all right. So for our residuals, it's our actual weight, and our actual weight was this, this data value of 153, and then our predicted weight was 153.515. So if I wanted to go back to my home screen, again, I would take my actual weight of 153 that you always get from your raw data, and I would subtract out, I'm gonna try and do this from memory, I think my predicted weight was 153.515, I'm hoping. And there is my residual, so negative 0.51 pounds. So I, I overestimated this woman's weight by about half a pound. Okay, I could do that for all of these data values, but it's just, it's so, uh, it just takes so long to do it by hand. So our calculator has a built-in residual function. So let me show you where that is. Let's go back into data entry. We're gonna head over to L3. 
but go up into the definition of L3 so that L3 has the black background, right? I'm not in the first cell. You can see L3, it's live, it's active, and it's got the black background. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to hit second in stat. So when we hit second in stat, that calls up our list menu. And my residuals happen to be in item seven. I've seen them in certain calculators where they're in seven, they're in eight, they're in nine, they're in six. Look on your calculator list. Somewhere in here is the word resid. If it's in seven, great. And if it's in somewhere else, great. Just scroll down to that number and hit enter. So what I'm telling my calculator, oh, that's not what I want. Oh, I don't think I scrolled down. Let's hit second stack, excuse me. And then I need to hit option seven. I need to actually hit resid. Okay, so what I'm telling my calculator is please define this third list as my residuals, okay? And when I hit enter, my calculator is gonna auto-populate with that. Okay, so you see all these numbers come in and look at for 63 inches. Do you see the residual there about negative 0.34? That's what we had calculated. Let's go down to the 70 inch tall woman. And if I, before I show it, I believe that residual is about negative half a pound, right? We got negative 0.515 and there it is, all right? So your calculator can get all of your residuals at once. That's fantastic. So if I ever actually ask you to calculate a residual, you can drop them into L3 and just read them off. The other thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to create a residual plot, right? So construct a residual plot. And we, we construct this residual plot to, to assess, hey, is this linear model a good fit? And when I say, is this linear model a good fit, like taking a look at it, yeah, it looks pretty good, right? It's looking like I hit most of those points. But our residual model is a key factor in whether our, our, our I shouldn't say our residual model, excuse me, our residual plot is a key factor to determine if our linear model is a good fitting model. So go with me for a moment, okay? So let's make a residual plot. I'm gonna go back into my stat plots and this time, Instead of doing L1 against L2, I'm gonna go L1 against my residuals. So let's go alter this. So down here to make a residual plot, you wanna change this to the residual list. So let's try this again. We're gonna hit second and stat, and we're gonna hit option seven, okay? Now in a moment, I'm gonna hit zoom nine. And what you want, and this might seem counterintuitive, but what you want in a residual mess, in a residual mess, what you want in a residual plot is a mess. You don't wanna see any patterns. You don't want to see a line. You don't want to see a parabola. You want it to look like something just kind of threw up on your screen. So no pattern whatsoever. So believe it or not, when you have no pattern in your residual plot, that's a good thing. That's what we're hoping for. All right. When you have a pattern in your residual plot, it means your current model, our linear model, is not good. It's not what we want. Okay. So let's take a look at this. When I hit zoom nine now, all right, I'm hoping you see this pattern in here. Do we see the parabola, right? We see the U. And we, we talked about this in example three, and the same thing is popping up right here. There's a U pattern in here. All right, so now let's back this up, okay? Because we thought our linear model was pretty good, right? R was pretty high, it looked like a line. Let me go and turn this line off for just a moment, okay? If you ever wanna turn the line off, you can see right now I'm hovering over the equal sign. It's got the black background. I'm just gonna turn the line off by hitting enter and you can see that the equal sign doesn't have the black background. I wanna go back to my original scatter plot, so let me change this back to um, L2 for a moment. Okay, so now let me hit zoom nine. Oops, there's that wonderful error. I'll go back to my home screen, zoom nine. So here's my original scatter plot, and yes, it looks linear, but can you also see a slight curve in there, right? You can kind of see it just curving up a little bit, and so, what that residual plot was trying to communicate to us was that yes, the line is good, but there's something better out there because we had a pattern in the residual plot. And specifically because it was a U, because it was a parabola, that residual plot is actually telling us move past the linear model. It's not the one you want. You actually want a quadratic model. All right, and this is part of what makes the residual plot so powerful is it'll tell you, is your current model good? If it is, great. And if not, it'll show you, it'll kind of light a map as to where you're, you're supposed to go. So let me restate all of this because I know it's a lot to take in, but I'm gonna start this entire program over, or this entire problem over, 
at least in terms of getting the LSRL. And then I'm going to show you where we wind up, okay? So here we go. We're looking at it. We're like, ooh, it looks strong, linear. Let me go ahead and run some linear regression. So I'm going to do stat calc 8. We're going to go L1, L2, Y1. All right, and we're feeling pretty good. I mean, look at that R, 0.995. Awesome, right? We're looking at our graph. Look at that, that line. It's hitting most of our points. We're thinking, yeah, this is great. So let's just check the residuals. So I'm gonna go and switch my Y's to the residuals, all right? And I wanna make a residual plot. And again, what I'm hoping for is just a hot mess. No, no pattern in there. And when I go to look at my residuals, I'm all, uh-oh, dude, look at this. There's a parabola in there, okay? All right, when there's the parabola, again, it's your residual plot's way of telling you there is a better option out there. So go with me, okay? So just watch at this point. I want to rerun linear regression, and I want you to keep in mind this R squared number, all right? So let's keep in mind 0.99, all right? So 99% here, all right? So just keep that number in mind. So here we go. Instead of running linear regression, because there was the U, I'm going to run quadratic. So I'm going to hit stat, calc, and I want to go to option 5, okay? So... Keep 99% in mind. We're not forgetting that number. 99% was linear, okay? Here we go. I'm going to go L1, L2, and so I can compare this, I'm going to go to Y2. Let me head down to Y2. And so what I'm asking my calculator to do now is, hey, instead of fitting a line to that data, can you fit a U? Can you fit a parabola? And let's just drop it in Y2 so we can compare it. All right, I'm about to hit enter. And before I do, again, I want to remind us, we had that R squared value of about 99%. Super strong, right? It's really close to one. So let's hit enter. All right, do you see that R squared got that much better? Do you see it now is up at 0.999, right? Now watch me hit graph. Oops, don't watch that. I forgot to change this. This is gonna be the big reveal. It's not. <laughs> Let me change this back to L1 and L2. And then I'm gonna have the big reveal. Okay, here we go. All right, big reveal time. Let's go back to our scatter plot. Zoom nine. Okay, so there was that line. Now watch the parabola. Do you see that the parabola actually hits those points just that much better, right? It actually hits it better. So let me go turn this off and watch this happen again, right? Here comes that. Do you see that parabola? It's just killing it, right? It's hitting all of those points. This is looking like a better model. And what we would ultimately do is we would make a new residual plot. Now that we ran this regression, let's go try the residual plot for the quadratics. And let's see what we get. Let me just change this back to residuals, all right? And, and since the last regression we did was quadratic, it'll be a new regression plot. I'm gonna hit zoom nine. And then do you see that this is more of a mess, right? I don't see a U in here. I don't see much of anything in here. And that's actually our calculator's way of telling us like, hey, this is good. This is, this is the one we want. So when you have a residual plot that is a hot mess like this, that's when you know to stop. You're like, all right, I'm done. Thanks. Thanks for playing. I'm going to keep the quadratic model. So again, just to recap, we graphed our data, right? Made a scatter plot, looked linear, ran some linear regression. We were feeling pretty good about it. But we made a residual plot and we saw the U in the residual plot. So we said, okay, that's not a good sign. So how about, since it told us to make a U, or it looked like a U in our residual plot, make a quadratic regression. So we did. We ran a parabola through our data, got a higher R squared, made a new residual plot, and that residual plot was a mess. So this is the model to keep. So believe it or not, for these women, their height and weight, they're not linearly related, they're quadratically related. Okay? All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Hey Math43, back for one more app. This isn't an example problem in the packet, but I just wanted to give you a visual in terms of what do residuals look like on a graph. So I have a different little applet here, and it says add at least two points to this graphing area. And if you go to this website, well, let me scroll this down just so you can see where it is. Um, if you decide to go to this, this URL, basically I'm just gonna add some points. I can add them in anywhere, and you, you can see that I've got 11 points so far, and they're telling me my correlation coefficient is about 
64% or I should say 0.64. I'll add some more in here. Okay, that's looking good. That's plenty of points. I can draw my own line, but really what I want, I want you to just see the LSRL. So imagine we had these 30 data values in L1 and L2, and there's 30 data points, all the X values in L1, all the Y values in L2, and we did stat calc 8, L1, L2, Y1. Um, and we could go get a residual plot, but I wanted to show you graphically what the residuals look like on the original scatter plot. Not on the residual plot, but on the scatter plot. So if you remember the formula for a residual, it is the actual Y value minus the predicted Y value. So our actual Y values are all of these red dots. Okay, so those are actual data points, right? We have actual Y values there. And our predicted Y values live along this blue line. So for example, if I just look at this first point that my, my mouse is hovering over, this red dot is my actual Y value. I don't know what height that would be. It would be somewhere over here, right? So let's just pretend if I was counting, maybe it's one, two, three, four. Maybe it's about four. I don't know, I'm making these numbers up. But it's four, right? And just below it, on the blue line, is my predicted Y value. So maybe it was about 3.5. If I subtracted those two numbers, right, this is my fake Y value of four, my predicted Y value of 3.5. And this is a little bit higher. That's why it's got a little bit larger number. So maybe this is four, 3.5. This would be a residual of about a half, okay? But I wanna show you graphically what all of our residuals are. They're a bunch of little vertical bars. So take a look, when I click on this show residuals, graphically, residuals are always the distance from your actual Y value to your predicted Y value. So from your red data point to your blue predicting line, right? So actual minus predicted, actual, oops, I think I clicked off of that one. We'll put it back in. Actual minus predicted, actual minus predicted, right? Or even when you underestimate something, right? Or excuse me, overestimate, actual minus predicted. And I said, overestimate because you can see this y value is lower like if I'm looking at this data value this y value is lower than what I predicted it to be so I overestimated this y value or here for this one that's above the LSRL I underestimate it right because I predicted this y value and it's actually up here so I just wanted to give you a quick look at what residuals look like on a graph they're just always the little vertical drops from your data point to your LSRL okay thanks guys Okay, we're back and we've seen how to construct a residual plot on our calculator. And I just wanna make sure I mention that there's a discrepancy between what we calculated by hand and what you just saw me do on my calculator. And that has to do with the fact that we rounded our decimals off. So let me go back through everything that we just did on our calculator, but I'll do it live right now. I'll do it with my real calculator, not my computer screened calculator. So if I wanna get those residuals, the first thing I have to do is I have to make sure there's an equation in Y1. It is, there is, I, I ran some regression, so I'm good there. But I can go into L3 and define that list to be my residuals. Now you saw my calculator on my computer screen, the list was in option seven. This is my home um, calculator. I actually named a list after myself. So my residuals are a little further down. They're actually in list number nine, but they're still there. So that will auto-populate. And when I'm talking about the decimal error, I wanna scroll down to the 63 inch tall woman. Her residual was negative 0.3405 here, which is slightly different from the negative 0.313 we got. And again, that's because we rounded her predicted weight at 128.313 pounds, where the calculator was able to save all of those decimals. For the woman who was 70 inches tall, we had her residual at negative 0.485 pounds. And if we go down to the calculator, it was a little bit higher, right? We would still ultimately round it to half a pound, but this was negative 0.485 and this is negative 0.515. I could make my residual plot and the same problem's about to happen that we saw when I was on my computer screen, right? There is this U shape here, this is a parabola. So what that's telling us, again, is that the linear model is not the best fit out there. And if I go back, if I change this back to my scatter plot, you can kind of see it, right? You can see that line, but you can all 
also see that curve in there, right? There is an actual U in that data. So towards the end of the calculator part of this video, I ran quadratic regression because that's what we do. When there's a U, we put a parabola to it and we call those quadratics in math. So I went through and I ran quadratic regression and to compare, I put this in Y2, right? I got my R squared value, which was higher for the quadratic than it was for the linear. And then if I hit zoom nine, right, there's that line it's doing a decent job, but look at that parabola. Man, that thing hits it out of the park. It hits all sorts, right? And if we wanna just isolate it and see the parabola, let me hover over the equal sign on my line, hit enter, and you can see now it's turned off, right? When it's flashing, it doesn't have the black background. And we can really see that parabola is doing a much better job of fitting the data, right? It's a better fitting model. So yes, in this case, I didn't need a linear model, I needed a quadratic model, but okay. And if I wanted to make a residual plot off of this quadratic model, well, I'll take a look. If I change this back to my residuals, now that residual plot is a mess. Ah, it's a better fitting model, okay? So let's, let's try and be really specific about what makes a good model and what doesn't make a good model on the next page. See you in a few. All right, guys, so in, in asking the question, is my model a good fit for the data? And we'll, we'll be specific on, is our linear model a good fit? Okay, we're, we're really gonna concentrate on, or we've been concentrating on linear models in this chapter. But there are three factors that I will want you to address when you're answering this question. So I will need you to address, does the scatter plot look linear? Right? If you are able to graph the scatter plot, you should comment on this. And if you're not, that's okay. But if you have a scatter plot, comment. Yes, it looks linear. Meh, I always do the meh, like it kind of looks linear, or no, it doesn't. So it kind of fits into those three categories along with the strong, moderate, or weak. Yes, it looks linear. Eh, looks kind of linear, or just no, it doesn't. It almost looks like a circle. All right, and then your R. It should be close to one or negative one for a good fit. So we'll have this, this like trio again, like R will either be strong, moderate, or weak. So you can be a happy face, a medium face, or a sad face, right? And we'll just keep collecting these, these good, medium, or bad, like in terms of how this model is fitting. The residual plot, it should be scattered for a good fit. And I am gonna say that the residual plot, this is the most important factor that goes into your decision. It, it's more important, it's the, key, it's the key factor. This is the one that's almost playing red light, green light in terms of if you have a scattered residual plot, it's telling you to stop, you found the model. If you do not have a scatter, like if you see a pattern, like we just saw, if we see a U or something else in the residual plot, it's like a green light. It's saying, no, the linear model is not the good one, go on, find a different model. All right, so the residual plot being scattered is by far the strongest indicator that you found the model you were looking for. So with that in mind, let's go play the height and weight data out again for, for example 13 and answer this question. Is the regression equation that we found in example 13 a good fit for the model? All right, so was that, that linear model, and if, if you're not remembering what model I'm talking about, this is when I said, I have a model, weight can be predicted with the equation negative 98.235, oops. Plus 3.596 times the height. Was that a good model? Do I wanna keep that or do I wanna to move to something different? So let's, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let's go to the scatter plot. All right, I'm, I'm capable of coming up with a scatter plot in this one, so I wanna address it. Now I left off on our residual plot, I'm gonna change that. So let me clear all of this, well, I won't clear it out. Let me turn all of this off, change this back to a scatter plot, and let's look, zoom nine. 
Does it look linear? Yes, it does. I mean, you might see that curve in there, but at the same time, it still does look linear. Like that, uh, it looks linear. So I'm gonna go ahead and say scatter plot linear, or it looks linear. And I'm gonna just give myself a happy face here. All right, so I'm pretty happy with that. Then I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna figure out what R is. All right, what is my correlation coefficient? And in order to do that, right, we're gonna do stat calc eight, L1, L2, oops, excuse me, L2, and I typically put that in Y1. And our R was awesome, 0.995, that is great. That is practically perfect. So as I'm rolling through these, I'm feeling pretty good. But then I gotta get to the strongest one. I gotta get to the residual plot. All right, so since linear regression now is the last regression I did, I can change this to resids and it'll default and do the residual for the linear model. So let's hit zoom nine. And unfortunately, I see a pattern in here, right? And since I see a pattern, that is bad news bears. So residual plot has a pattern. And I'm gonna put a sad face. And again, this is the strongest factor. So when it comes to my answer, when it says, is this equation good fit for the data? The answer is no, no it's not. So even though the scatter plot was looking linear, and even though R was super close to being perfect at one, this is the most important factor. All right, the residual plot is telling us the linear model is not a good fit for the data. All right, so let me make sure I answer that no. Right, linear model is not a good fit for the data. And the reason for that is because there was a pattern in the residual plot. All right. And why the residual plot is so important is not only is there a pattern, but it's telling us where, where we should go next. Go to quadratic regression. All right, we had a parabola in our residual plot. So what statisticians would do next is we would try quadratic regression. Okay, and when I say quadratic regression, we're gonna go quad reg L1, L2, and I typically drop that one into Y2. And as you're getting this down, like let's just zoom out. This is the general idea behind regression. I, I did this stuff, when, when I had to do regression analysis in grad school, we'd have, I'd be using Minitab, but we'd, we'd take our data set and we'd run almost every regression we had. We'd try linear, quadratic, cubic, exponential, sinusoidal, logarithmic, logistic, you name it. We'd get all of these computer outputs. So the first thing I would do is I would look and say, well, what did the scatter plots look like mathematically? Like, does this look like a line? Does it look like a parabola? Does it look exponential, right? And then I would look either at the R, if we were talking about the linear regression, or the R squareds for the rest of them. And maybe out of my 10 regression analysis, I'd take the, like, the five best R squareds, right? And then out of those five, I'd whittle it down even further. And I'd say, well, out of all of those, those remaining five, which ones have the best looking residual plots, right? And the one with the best residual plots, again, I would wean that, that stack of five now down to maybe two or three. And we're not gonna do the fourth factor here, but the S, the standard residual length, or the average residual length, that was yet another factor that could go into your decision. We're not gonna cover that too much in this, in this um, class, but there was even a fourth factor that went in. So I'd find the one with the smallest S, and I'd be like, okay, that's it. That's my, my regression model. That's my predicting function, and I'm gonna use that and predict into the future. And I can't tell you how many times I got it wrong. It's really hard to get a proper fitting model, but this is that process. 
Look at your scatter, scatter plot. Crunch a regression equation. See what the residual plot looks like. Is it red light or green light, right? Do you stop because you have a mess in your scatter plot, excuse me, in your residual plot? Or do you go because you have a pattern in your residual plot? And again, just to finish this off, because there was that parabola here, the next thing I would do, I would try the next regression model. I would try quadratic. I would see that that R squared increased. I would take a look, oops, I have the wrong thing up, excuse me. Oop, we'll get that fixed. I would go back, turn this into a scatter plot, take a look and say, okay, yeah, the line was good. Fantastic, the let, then there's my parabola. You can see it's better. And let's try its residuals. And this time, since quadratic regression was the last one I did, I'll get the residual plot for the quadratics. And that is a lot more messy than my linear, uh, my linear model's residual plot.